Never have I ever seen so many students who graduated with good degrees such as Masters in Computer Science, Masters in Computer Information Systems or Masters in Business Analytics struggle so much to get a job. Almost every other day I get emails from students all over the country asking for volunteer positions so that they can secure their OPT and look for a job in the meantime. The issue is that fewer and fewer companies are willing to hire those who need H-1B visa sponsorship. To make the matters worse, it is very difficult for even local graduates to find a job now. Those who are US citizens or hold green cards are also finding very difficult to find a job. Just see what is happening at Intel right now. Intel is laying off 15% of its workforce. That means that around 20,000 of Intel employees are about to lose their jobs and they will be in the job market as well. So those who already had jobs are going to lose their job. What to talk of those people who are looking for their first position on the top of that, they need H-1B sponsorship. So what is happening with the new graduates who are out there looking for a job? Well, many of them have decided to go back, but some of them are still trying. They have some hopes still that they can find something good. And many of those who want to continue fighting and stay back, they often take an approach that I hate to the core. The approach that I would never take for myself and I would strongly advise anyone to avoid that situation is going to a desi consultancy have them fight for your h1b and then look for a job as a contractor trust me that is going to be a hellhole of a life but to my surprise many many people do this in fact recently in dallas area where i live there was this case where 15 girls were all locked in the basement of a home they were getting trained or they were getting sponsored by this desi consultancy and they were looking for a job and they were caught all these girls had graduated with master's degrees from the US and then were living in a basement with bare minimum facilities. See, what happens is that many people who graduate from American universities come here after they take heavy loans from their home countries. And these people do not have enough funds to live here for very long without a job. So these people, when they go to DC consultancies, they are forced to live like cattles by them. These stupid DC consultancies supposedly train them in technologies that are in high demand. And in some cases, perhaps in many cases, I have heard that they even fake their resumes. They show some cooked up experience to find a job as a contractor. And to make the matters worse, there are several layers to this contracting business. What happens is that many a times the end client for whom they are actually doing the work is an American company and this American company doesn't want to hire people for long term. They are looking for some short term projects. So they hire these contractors and where do they find these contractors? They go to American consulting companies to give them temporary employees. All right. And where do American companies find these employees? they actually contract to Desi consultancies. And in many cases, there is not just two layers, which is American consultants and Desi consultancy. There are some one, two, three more consultancies in between as well. So when the end client pays a hefty salary, the American consultancy takes a cut and gives the remaining amount of money to the next consultancy. And by the time you go through all these consultancies and the actual contractor gets the money, the amount of money that they get in hand is quite less. And in most cases, these are very short term contracts. So you go and work for an end client for a few months at best one, two, three years, and then you have to look for a job all over again. In most cases, it's just about maybe one year. So what it means is that the uncertainty of income is very high among these people. I do not need to elaborate much, but I can simply say that whoever goes to these DC consultancies and starts to work as a contractor, they do not really have any careers. They are just in a survival mode. They for the most part have failed careers and are just suffering through this process. So let me just ask you, is this why you invested so much time and money to earn that degree, come to America and work as a contractor through a DC consultancy company? Is this the kind of life you want to live? Is this the kind of life that you envisioned for yourself when you first came here? So what is the solution then? So here comes the important point of this video. You see in the title, I said master's students did not listen to me and now they are suffering. So the title makes it obvious that I had cautioned many, many master's students beforehand that this could happen. See, I've been personally helping and guiding many master's students for a few years now. I was doing all this well before I started my YouTube journey. So what happened then is that it was getting very exhausting to talk to each student individually. What used to happen is that one student would ask me a few questions and later in the evening another student would call me and ask me the same set of questions. So I was wasting time and it was getting very exhausting to keep answering the same questions for so many students, about a dozen of them. 
So what I decided is that, you know what, let me just start a YouTube channel and put all the content there. And using that content, the questions will be answered for all these people, not just those 5, 10, 12 students, but in fact, maybe thousands of people can benefit from knowing whatever they need to know. So after I started this YouTube channel, I stopped interacting with new people one on one. And I now exclusively share my insights through YouTube videos. But I did not give up on those people who I was already interacting with before YouTube. So what happened to some of these students? Well, they are in the position that I just described. But the disappointing part is that I already feared that this situation could come on them. I had been cautioning them right from the beginning and giving them my solutions to tackle the situation. No matter how many times I warned them, they just did not listen to me. So let me put this out in public and give my solution so that some people can actually avoid this terrible situation. So here is my solution. So before I give my solution out, let me make it clear that this solution is not going to apply to most of the people. This solution applies largely to top 5% students, maybe 10%, maybe 15%, at most 25%. But I sincerely believe that this solution works only for about the best 5% students. The rest of them, I'm not entirely sure if they can take much from this. If you do not consider yourself among the top 5-10% students, this solution is not going to work for you. See, the basic premise of my solution is that everyone has a master's degree. When you apply for a single job, you're competing against thousands of people with similar qualifications who are also applying for the same job. Therefore, it is quite unlikely that you will stand out among thousands of people who are just as qualified as you are. Because, come on, get real, even Google, Microsoft, Intel employees are getting laid off left and right. And these people who are getting laid off were supposed to be best of the best engineers. When best of the best are losing their jobs, what chance do you think you have? Nearly nothing. So what you should do instead is as following. These are the six steps I have for you. So the step number one, the first step is that when you start your master's program, opt for a thesis option. What happens in many cases is that many of these master's programs have two different options to graduate. In some cases, they have three options. At least when I was a master's student, we had two options. One was a thesis option where we had to take, if I'm not mistaken, apart from your prerequisite courses, you had to take six master's level courses along with the thesis. However, if you do not want to go for thesis, you had to do a project, but you had to do one extra coursework. And now my university offers a third option. Uh, my university, I mean the university where I graduated from with a master's degree. Now they have a third option, which is all course option, where you have to take two additional courses rather than doing project or a thesis. So if you go for a thesis option, you have to take two courses less. And in the middle is your project option with one extra course and one project. Overall, it can vary between universities, but by and large, this is more or less how universities operate when giving their master's degrees. So in summary, my step number one is that you should take thesis option. Step number two is that you identify a good professor who you like and whose research you like and ask them to be your mentor for your thesis. Start working with them on a research project for your thesis as soon as you can. If possible, right in your first semester. And if not, in the second semester, but you need to get started as soon as you can. Step number three is that you should try and publish two to three papers, at least two to three conference papers while you're a master's student. Ideally, you should have two to three papers published by your third semester, which is uh, quite uh, difficult to achieve. But at least by your fourth semester, you should have two or three conference papers. At least at minimum, you should have one conference paper, ideally two. If you have three conference papers, that is uh, even better. Step number four, while you're a master's student, try your level best to earn a good internship opportunity. Make sure that the company with whom you're doing your internship actually is going to sponsor your H-1B visa. When I did my internship as a master's student, the two companies I worked for were not doing H-1B visas. So it was not very useful for me in that context. The internship itself was fantastic, but the company won't do your H-1B visa. So what's the point? So ideally you should go for an internship at a company that is going to sponsor your H-1B visa. And in case you are not able to secure a good internship opportunity, you can use your summer to make more progress on your thesis. So let us assume that you start in fall. So you have completed your fall semester, you have completed your spring semester. In an ideal scenario, you will do an internship in your summer semester, which is your third semester. In case you're not able to find a good internship, you should make significant progress in your research during that summer semester. Try and make as much progress on your thesis. By this time that they have spent one year in the US, many people get homesick and then they just run away to their home countries. Uh, you need to have more patience than that. You are here to give a fight. 
do not get carried away by your emotions because this is going to cost you much more later. Now comes step number five. By this time, I'm assuming that you took thesis option, you have identified your professor, you are already working on several papers, at least one, two, three papers, and then you have been able to get some of them published, maybe at least a conference paper you have been able to publish. Now you need to communicate with your thesis advisor. Tell your professor clearly that you are going to apply for jobs, but you'll also concurrently apply for PhD admissions. Make sure that by this time you have also identified at least two other professors who are willing to write you a good recommendation letter for jobs and also for PhD admissions. Because for PhD admissions, getting letters from three good professors is very important. And now we come to a step number six. Do two things simultaneously. Apply for jobs, but at the same time, also selectively apply for PhD admissions. Why do I say that? Well, the thing is that going for a PhD is a much better and a much safer option than being unemployed. It is surely a better option than putting yourself in a position where you have to write emails to professors begging them for volunteer positions. It is much, much better than living with 15 other people in a basement of a home and looking for a job and depending on your employer, the DC consultancy to find you contracts. The issue simply is that master's degree starts like this and ends like that. Whereas in PhD program, you have enough time. You have three, four, five, six summers to look for internships. You have more time at your hand. You can be a bit more relaxed. You can actually plan your career accordingly. Whereas in a master's program, you finish two semesters, you have to quickly look for an internship, then you have to quickly look for a job, all those things. And by the time you graduate, you are either lucky or you're struggling. There is no time to breathe as a master's student. There is no tehrav in that sense. In the PhD program, on the other hand, you have more time and more opportunities. Now, if you're able to get a job in time, great, fantastic, congratulations. If not, you at least have a good PhD admission to fall back on. Now, a very big mistake that many master's students make is that during their master's program, they did not build a profile at all that could be attractive for them to get an admission into a PhD program. Their CV and their profile shows no progress towards any kind of research whatsoever. Forget publications, they did not even go for a thesis option. But a few months after they graduate, they start applying for PhD admissions. Even my own students who were enrolled in my classes started sending me emails a few months after they graduated saying that now they are interested in PhD. Let me make it clear, professors are no fools. We know exactly why you are applying for PhD admissions. And most of us will treat you as high risk candidates. A high risk candidate, in my opinion, is the one who applies for PhD programs and tries to gain admission only temporarily so that when the market improves and then they can get a job, they will immediately quit and join that job instead. Well, to be fair and to be honest, that applies to all PhD students. Anyone can be a risky candidate. You cannot predict the future, right? But if it is absolutely clear from your CV that you have no inclination towards research, you have done nothing to make your profile better, in context of getting admission into a PhD program, you're obviously more of a high risk than anyone else. In fact, this happened with me, with students who were enrolled in my class. There were two or three students who took classes with me. While they were enrolled as master students, they did not show any interest in research. For heaven's sake, they did not even show interest in the class that they were enrolled in. They were just barely getting by. They did not do too well in those classes. And then they had the audacity to write me an email saying that they are suddenly interested in PhD program. It was too obvious to me that they wrote those emails expressing interest in doing PhD under me because they were not able to get any job. There was nothing on their CV to indicate research potential and research interests. And to make the matters worse, it was very clear to me that the emails that they wrote were written by ChatGPT. It was no way a personalized email expressing genuine interest. For example, I'm a business professor and these students who were enrolled in my class never ever showed up to my office to ask me about anything and then they write in an email that they are very impressed with my research work, they really liked my lab. Well, I did not know I had a lab. I'm a business professor. I have an office and have a computer in my office. <laughs> I have not been to a lab at all. Another fake attempt that they make is that they go through my CV, look at some of the papers and they see what paper title they are able to understand a bit and then use those keywords from my titles saying that they are very interested in this kind of research. Well, I stopped doing that kind of research. In fact, I just wrote one paper and they are still saying that they are interested in my work. And it is quite funny, especially with South Asian students who, who say things like, you're a highly esteemed faculty member. I was extremely impressed by your research, blah, blah. Well, did I win a Nobel Prize or what? 
I, okay? Why are you saying all this? So if students who are enrolled in my class say things like that they are very impressed by my lab, what to talk about those who are strangers to me? Can you even imagine what kind of emails they write? Simply put, I just do not take them seriously. So their last attempt to salvage their careers and avoid going to a Desi consultancy and instead enrolling in a PhD program is all going to go waste. Therefore, as I said early on, this solution is not for everyone. Truth be told, forget PhD level research. 75% master students cannot even do a decent master's level thesis. So if you think you're among the better 25% students who are able to do a master's level thesis at least, well, you're already ahead of the majority. Then among the better 25% of the students who take thesis option, Roughly only about half of them will be able to get any publication. Remaining half will graduate with a thesis, but I don't think they can get even one conference paper out. So my message is only for among the better 10% students who go for thesis and are able to get papers out. Please make these plans even before you start your master's program. Everyone here has a master's degree. You need something better. You need something superior to stand out. You cannot be doing the same thing that everyone else is doing and expect somehow a magical and a different result for yourself. So let us see how this scenario plays out. Let's say in spite of having a very good profile, you're still unable to find a good job because let's be real, market is not in your control. But your profile is still good enough that you could secure a good PhD position. Now, at least you'll be making some money. I know it won't be much, but it'll be enough for you to have a room of your own. You don't need to share your room with 15 other graduates in the basement of a home. At least you have a legal and a valid reason to stay back. You, in fact, you'll be learning more during your PhD. And the best thing is that you can apply for internship as a PhD student. In fact, many PhD students, especially in computer science, actually do internships during summers. That way you can get real experience while you are building a good research profile. And during this time, if you happen to really like your PhD program and your PhD research is going really well, you can go ahead and carry on with that. On the other hand, if you see that you're struggling with your PhD program, but you are able to get a good position in a company, well, you can have a conversation with your doctor advisor. And with your doctoral advisor, you can make a call for your future. Again, I repeat, I know that this solution is not everyone's cup of tea, but it can really help and work for some. At least that is what I did. Simple, I refused to go to any damn Desi consultancy company. Instead, I took a much more difficult route and it worked wonderfully for me. It changed my life. Some of the students who did not listen to any of my advice kept saying that they need to make money. Well, how much money are they making now? Zero. Being a PhD student at least doesn't make you unemployed. You are actually employed in the university setting. Now they are earning zero. In a PhD program, they would have been earning a lot more than zero. Moreover, had they listened to me, planned ahead and enrolled in a PhD program right after their masters, by this time, 50 to 60% of their PhD would have been already complete. But as is the case most of the times, these people just did not listen to me. And I know that most of you who are watching me are not going to listen to me. And sadly, many of you will find yourself in a tight position. But it was my duty and my job to make this suggestion. Of course, people are free to make their own calls. Thank you for watching. Jai Hind and God bless America.